Pozadie. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها النبي قل لأزواجك إن كنتن تردن الحياة الدنيا وزينتها فتعالين أمتعكن وأسرحكن سراحا جميلا وإن كنتن تردن الله ورسوله والدار الآخرة فإن الله أعد للمحسنات منكن أجرا عظيما يا نساء النبي من يأت منكن بفاحشة مبينة يضاعف لها العذاب ضعفين وكان ذلك على الله يسيرا وَمَنْ يَقْنُتْ مِنْكُنَّ لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَتَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا نُؤْتِهَا أَجْرَهَا مَرَّتَيْنِ نُؤْتِهَا أَجْرَهَا مَرَّتَيْنِ وَأَعْتَدْنَا لَهَا رِزْقًا كَرِيمًا يَا نِسَاءَ النَّبِيِّ لَسْتُنَّ كَأَحَدٍ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِنْ اتَّقَيْتُنْ فلا تخضعن بالقول فيطمع الذي في قلبه مرض وقلن قولا معروفا وقرن في بيوتكن ولا تبرجن تبرج الجاهلية الأولى وأقمن الصلاة وآتين الزكاة وأطعن الله ورسوله إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجز أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا واذكرن ما يتلى في بيوتكن من آيات الله والحكمة إن الله كان لطيفا خبيرا إن المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما جزاك الله خير أبو عبد الرحمن تفضل وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم ومن يعص الله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا مبينا وَإِذْ تَقُولُ لِلَّذِي أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْسِكْ عَلَيْكَ زَوْجَكَ وَاتَّقِ اللَّهَ وَتُخْفِي فِي نَفْسِكَ مَا اللَّهُ مُبْدِيهِ وَتَخْشَى النَّاسَ وَأَنْ تَخْشَى النَّاسَ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ تَخْشَاهِ فلما قضى زيد منها وطرا زوجناكها لكي لا يكون على المؤمنين حرج في أزواج أدعيائهم لكي لا يكون على المؤمنين حرج في أزواج أدعيائهم إذا قضوا منهن وطرا وَإِنْ كَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ مَفْعُولًا مَا كَانَ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ مِنْ حَرَجٍ فِيمَا فَرَضَ اللَّهُ لَهُ سُنَّةَ اللَّهِ فِي الَّذِينَ خَلَوْا مِنْ قَبْلُ وَكَانَ أَمْرُ اللَّهِ قَدَرًا مَقْدُورًا 
الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشونه ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله وكفى بالله حسيبا ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء عليما يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا وسبحوه بكرا كرة وأخيلا والذي يصلي عليكم وملائكته ليخرجكم من الظلمات إلى النور وكان بالمؤمنين رحيما جزاك الله خير جزاء دكتور رضوان تفضل تحيتهم يوم يلقونه سلام وعد لهم أجرا كريما يا أيها النبي إنا أرسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا وبشر المؤمنين بأن لهم من الله فضلا كبيرا ولا تطع الكافرين والمنافقين ودع ذاهم وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا نكحتم من آتكم مطلقتم من قبل من قبل أن تمسوهن فما لكم عليهن من عدة تعتدونها فمتعوهن وسرحوهن سراحا جميلا يا أيها النبي إنا أحللنا لك أزواجك التي آتيت وجورهن وما ملكت يمينك مما فاء الله عليك وبنات عمك وبنات عماتك وبنات عماتك وبنات خالك وبنات خالاتك التي هاجرن معك وامرأة مؤمنة وهبت نفسها للنبي أن إن أراد النبي أن يستنكع غالزة لك إن أراد النبي أن يستنكع غالزة لك من دون المؤمنين قد علمنا ما فرضنا عليهم في أزواجهم وما ملكت أيمانهم لكي لا يكون عليك حرج وكان الله غفورا رحيما جزاك الله يا ابو ابراهيم تفضل ترجي من تشاء منهم وتؤوي اليك من تشاء من تشاء ومن ابتغيت ممن أذلت فلا جناح عليك ذلك أدنى أن تقر أعينهم ولا يهدن وينضين بما آتيتهن كلهم وينضين بما آتيتهن كلهم والله يعلم ما في قلوبكم وكان الله عليما حليما لا يحل لك النساء من بعد ولا أن تبدل بهن من أزواج ولو أعجب 
ولو أعجبك حسنهن إلا ما ملكت يمينك وكان الله على كل شيء رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تدخلوا بيوت النبي إلا أن يؤذن لكم إلى طعام غير ناظرين إلى غير ناظرين إلى ولكن ولكن إذا دعيتم فادخلوا فادخلوا فإذا طعمتم فانتشروا ولا مستأنسين لحديث إن ذلكم إن ذلكم كان يؤذي النبي فيستحي من فيستحي منكم والله لا يستحي من الحق وإذا سألتموهم متاعا فاسألوهن من وراء حجاب ذلكم أطهر أطهر لقلوبكم وقلوبهم وما كان لكم أن تؤذوا رسول الله ولا أن تنكحوا أزواجه من بعده أبدا إن ذلكم كان عند الله عظيما إن تبدو شيئا أو تخفوه فإن الله كان بكل شيء عليما جزاك الله خير بدر أقبال Would you like to unmute yourself? لا جناه عليهن في آبائهن ولا أبنائهن ولا إخوانهن ولا أبناء إخوانهن ولا أبناء أخواتهن ولا نسائهن ولا ما ملكت أيمانهن واتقين الله إن الله كان على كل شيء شهيدا إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله سيدنا محمد سيدنا محمد المبارك وسلم عليه إن الذين يؤذون الله ورسوله لعنهم الله في الدنيا والآخرة وأعد لهم عذابا مهينا والذين يؤذون المؤمنين والمؤمنات بغير ما اكتسبوا بغير ما اكتسبوا فقد اختملوا بهتانا واسما مبينا يا أيها النبي كل أزواجك وبناتك ونساء المؤمنين يدنين عليهن من جلابي بهم ذلك أدنى أن يؤرفن فلا يؤذين وكان الله غفورا رحيما لئن لم ينتهي المنافقون والذين في قلوبهم مرض والمرجفون في المدينة لنغرينك في المدينة لنغرينك بهم ثم لا يجاورونك فيها إلا خليلا ملغونين عينما سقفوا أخذوا وقتلوا تقتيلا سنة الله في الذين خلوا من قبل ولن تجل سنة الله تبديلا جزاك الله خير جزاء دكتور سامة would you like to read unmute yourself please دكتور سامة يسألك الناس عن الساعة قل إنما علمها عند الله وما يدريك لعل الساعة تكون قريبا 
إن الله لعن الكافرين وأعد لهم سعيرا خالدين فيها أبدا لا يجدون وليا ولا نصيرا يوم تقلب وجوههم في النار يقولون يا ليتنا أطعنا الله وأطعنا الرسولا وقالوا ربنا إنا أطعنا ساداتنا وكبراءنا فأضلون السبيلا ربنا آتهم ضعفين من العذاب ولعنهم لعنا كبيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تكونوا كالذين آذوا موسى فبرأه الله مما قالوا وكان عند الله وجيها يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما إنا عرضنا الأمانة على السماوات والأرض إنا عرضنا الأمانة على السماوات والأرض والجبال فأبين أن يحملنها وأشفقنا منها وحملها الإنسان إنه كان ظلوما جهولا ليعذب الله المنافقين والمنافقات والمشركين والمشركات ويتوب الله ويتوب الله على المؤمنين والمؤمنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما الله يفتح عليك صدق الله العظيم I think we'll stop here إن شاء الله إن شاء الله we'll finish the 22nd جزء and we'll start إن شاء الله with the 23rd جزء إن شاء الله tomorrow I've got a hadith for you which uh, touches so many of you إن شاء الله probably all of you Inshallah, I'm, I'm sure you've heard it so many times before, but I think it will just to give you a bit more of boost, inshallah, in your confidence. وعن عائشة رضي الله عنها قالت قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الذي يقرأ القرآن وهو ماهر به مع السفر الكرام البررة والذي يقرأ القرآن ويتعتع فيه وهو عليه شاق له أجوان Aisha may Allah be pleased with her reported the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the one who is proficient in the recitation of the Quran will be with the honorable and obedient uh, angels and servants and he who recites the Quran and find it difficult to recite, doing his best to recite it in the best way possible, will have a double reward. Narrated, uh, recorded in Al Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, Sheikh Mahsan, do you want to add anything? Uh, just one thing came in my mind during uh, you know, your hadith is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates. Uh, the recital of his books of his book so it's the appreciation from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and subhanallah we should uh, we should ourselves like appreciate allah for giving us the book but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is he himself is appreciating our effort to to be in connection with his book uh, how merciful and how yani subhanallah uh, allah azza wa jal yani generous and uh, uh, you know, with with, with us, uh, and may Allah subhanahu wa taala inshallah make us among the uh, reciter. And one thing is uh, mentioned in one of the hadith is the Quran will come uh, and will be your your mu'nis, your companion in the graveyard. And as as we know, Subhanallah, yati uh, Quran fi fi surati in in the shape or the image of a handsome man. Or a handsome person to uh, give you company in the graveyard, so you will not we will not be alone if we are committed and connected to this Quran. Inshallah, Azza wa Jazakallah khair. Jazakumullah khair. When I when I was reading this hadith, it occurred to me that I could identify the two groups: those who are proficient, and Alhamdulillah, there are so many of them in this group. And those who are trying their best to recite it. 
I wondered where would I fit? I, I don't fit with either really. Uh, so subhanAllah, inshallah Allah uh, will grant us all uh, some mercy and uh, um, you know, sort of, uh, we'll count it in our uh, hasanat inshallah. There's uh, a timely entrance of uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Asim. Uh, mashallah, the beard is becoming more and more handsome, mashallah. And he has lost weight, Sheikh Mahsin. But I asked him, I lost weight. Yeah, community given, community given him hard time, Sheikh. Right. Okay. Without I, I welcome him again and uh, for his support to this group. And without any th further ado, I'll, I'll invite him to speak. I'll just remind you of his requirements is that we blank our screen and uh, we will mute our uh, microphones and I'll say I think you went on mute Dr. Saad I said uh, I, I don't know whether you've heard me all I said is that uh, Sheikh Asim wants us to blank the screen and mute the microphone. So okay. I've done that. Maybe I done it too early. Too quickly. It's, it's, it's all yours. It's all yours. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-mursaleen. Khatam al-anbiya wa rahmatul alameen. Sayyidna wa habibana wa shafi'ana wa maulana Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbi ajma'een. As always, alhamdulillah, a pleasure to be here with uh, my dear brothers and sisters, mashallah, mubarak. Um, tonight, uh, by no surprise, if, if with your permission, I heard yesterday's uh, reminder from Dr. Hisham and really, subhanAllah, I, I found it uh, eye-opening and, and really, really beneficial. So um, with your permission, I'd like to continue a couple of those themes that he mentioned from last night, just because I think they're relevant uh, in, the, in the midst of our discussion today. So I hope, inshallah, I have your ijazah to do that. Uh, and if I do, I will, I will continue along that vein. So the first thing to note when it comes to where we are in Ramadan, and we will come to obviously the last 10 days specifically in Laid al Qadr specifically in a moment or two. But it's important that we understand in terms of where we are with these last 10 days. We are in the final straight. We are in the last stint of Ramadan, we could say. And this is important to understand. Because at this point, a lot of people start to worry. A lot of people already this week, they've been saying things like, you know, I haven't done enough. I feel I, I, I've, I've, I've let myself down. <clears throat> and this happens every year. 20, 21 days of Ramadan have gone. I could have done so much more. I've missed out on this, I've missed out on that. People start to get a little bit overwhelmed with the negativity. And that's understandable because we can always do more. Uh, that's not human nature. We feel we can always do much more than perhaps what we've done. What's really important to remember is there is still time remaining of Ramadan. And because there is time remaining, instead of lamenting what was past, we should focus on what's ahead of us. So I hope today, inshallah, I'm going to help myself first and maybe you'll benefit to focus with what remains of the time of Ramadan. Ibn al-Jawzi, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, said, when a racehorse knows that it's ending, coming to the end of the track, it exerts more of its effort to win the race. Don't allow the racehorse to be more clever than you, for verily deeds are judged by their conclusions. So if you didn't do well with the beginning of Ramadan, welcoming Ramadan, perhaps you will be doing better bidding it farewell. That's a very profound statement. Maybe we didn't do great for the first 20 days of Ramadan. Maybe there's so much more we could do. But Allah has always given us opportunity. Until we breathe our last breath, Allah always gives us opportunities to do better. So with the last 10 days, we can bid farewell in the best of ways. Not just Ibn al Jawzi. Others said the same, similar things. Ibn al Taymiyyah, Ibn al he said, the lessons lie in the perfection of the conclusion of a thing, not in the shortcomings of the beginning. So how we end something, and this, subhanAllah, is a lesson not just for Ramadan, my brothers and sisters. This is a lesson for life. Many, many people we know have probably lived their lives in Jahaliyyah. 
And then just at the end of their life, they take shahada, all of their sins are forgiven and they enter Jannah. So we need to make sure that the end of our Ramadan, the end of our life, the end of our whatever it is that we're doing, that everything, subhanAllah, should be great towards the end, towards the conclusion, rather than just in the beginning. And of course, the great Sheikh Al-Hassan Al-Basri, Rahimallah, he said, improve your performance of what is left of time and you will be forgiven for everything which is already passed. So take special care of your time you have left because you don't know when your soul will turn back to Allah. Take special care of the time you have left because you don't know when your soul will be turned back to Allah. Again, not just wise words for Ramadan, wise words for life, because these are things that will happen throughout our lives. We need to be ready for the end of our life. We need to be ready for the conclusion of things. We need to be mindful that we don't know when life will be taken from us and Allah will cause us to die. So whatever time he has given us, if today was our last day, if today really was our last day in this dunya, how would we behave? How would we want our last day to be run? How would we want our last day to be worshipping Allah? These are things we need to remind ourselves of on a regular basis. So with that in mind, yesterday, subhanAllah, Dr. Hisham talked about some beautiful images. And, and, and I think Dr. Saad used the word mesmerizing. And I agree, it was mesmerizing in the sense that the descriptions of committees of angels coming down in the last 10 days on Layl Qadr, committees of angels, I mean, what a, what a fantastic uh, description he gave. And he gave us all of the knowledge that we need. I'm not going to repeat any of those things about when the, when the Layl Qadr might be, you know, the things we ought to be doing on Layl Qadr. So instead of focusing on those, I just want to zoom our camera lens in for a moment or two on something very specific, if I might. And hopefully that may prove beneficial, inshallah. I believe, uh, as far as I, I think you may have been reading Surah Al-Ahzab, I think, tonight. And if that is the case, uh, forgive me, I couldn't join early enough. But if, if, if it is the case that you read from Surah Al-Ahzab, this is correct. It is. It, is, is that somebody? So I think Dr. Sayyid Saad is saying, yes, you did? It's... Yeah, alhamdulillah. Okay. In that case, if, if it is the case you read from Surah Al-Ahzab, you will have noticed on ayah number 41, that ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا ذكرا كثيرا ذكرا كثيرا Oh you who believe remember Allah with ذكرا كثيرا with a great remembrance with much remembrance with enormous amounts of remembrance Why am I mentioning this at the beginning of talking about Laylatul Qadr? Because one of the things that struck me, subhanAllah, yesterday with Dr. Hisham's reminder, all of the things that we are being asked to do on Laylatul Qadr are all, of course, the dhikr of Allah. We know the Prophet, salam, encourages to pray the Qiyam layl Whoever stands in prayer, hoping for Allah's uh, reward and forgiveness, will have all of his previous sins forgiven. What is prayer? Allah SWT tells us in the Quran, establish the prayer for my remembrance. So the prayer is dhikr of Allah. So we should be making kathir and dhikr, lots of dhikr, great amounts of dhikr, multitudinous dhikr. Prayer is one of those methods. The other thing Dr. Hisham mentioned yesterday, we should be reading the Quran in copious amounts. The Quran refers to itself. Allah refers to the Quran in the Quran as al-dhikr, the dhikr, like the height of dhikr. It is Allah's uttered word. What else did he mention? He said making dua. How can you make du'a, as we spoke a couple of weeks ago about the concept of how can you make du'a except that you mention Allah and remember Allah that you're making du'a to him? So there's another element of dhikr. So all of these elements of worship that we're going to be talking, that we, we've been uh, encouraged to try to perform during Laylatul Qadr or in our seeking of Laylatul Qadr, they all involve dhikr. But I just want to mention something in that space. And I have mentioned it before, but I want to remind myself as we get close to seeking Laylatul Qadr in these last 10 nights. Let us make our dhikr conceptualized, not just, not just flowing from the tongue, but let it flow from the heart as well. Let it flow from the heart. The heart needs to engage in the dhikr. The heart needs to engage in the understanding. If we're making salah, if we're making salah and we're going through 50 raqa in the night, 
but we haven't connected with that salah. We haven't engaged with the salah. Remember the, the description of the munafiq in the Quran, one of the descriptions of the munafiq is that when they stand up to pray, they do so lazily, remembering Allah very little. If we don't remember Allah, Allah is saying establish the salah for my remembrance. If we don't remember Allah, we just go through the motions. Is it properly? Is that what is that what we're meant to get? Are we now getting the full benefit of it? What do we say about the, the successful, the, the people who are successful? Successful indeed are the believers. Those who pray with khushu. Khushu necessitates connecting with your salah, feeling it, living it, conceptualizing it. That's what we'd want to try to get in these last 10 nights. So all of those acts of worship that I mentioned are all dhikr. But what I'm hoping is, inshallah, we can conceptualize that worship. We can conceptualize that dhikr. We can feel it, not just say it, not just do it, but feel it, actually feel it. And in that space, there is something in particular that I wanted to focus two little elements, if I might, uh, on for, for the purposes of our, of our discussion tonight. The one is the reminder uh, that Rasulullah gave to Aisha anha when she was asked, what should we do if we were to find Layat al-Qadr? What should we do if we were to find Layat al-Qadr? This is really important, okay? So we, we, we're reminded that Aisha anha. now why is this important? Aisha anha is asking Rasulullah Sallam, that if she were to find Layat al-Qadr, what should she do? He, she said roughly translated in this particular narration, which is in uh, Nimaja Tirmidhi and, and the Muslim of Imam Ahmed. She said, oh, Messenger of Allah, if I knew which night is Layat al-Qadr, if I were to find Layat al-Qadr, what should I say during it? And he instructed her to say, Allahumma inna ka afubun tuhibbul afa fahfu anni. Okay, now why is this so important? We all know that Rasulullah when he was asked about who is the most beloved to you, who did he say? He said that the most beloved person to uh, himself <laughs> was Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha radiallahu anha is the most beloved person. So the most beloved person to him, salam, is asking him, if I find Laytul Qadr, if I'm, I'm worshipping on Laytul Qadr, what should I do? What should I say? And he gives her these three phrases. And I'm purposely not translating it just yet. I see many people already speak Arabic. So there's no point of me giving my useless translation in a minute. But I, I want for the rest of us to try to understand what this means. Remember, I just said a minute ago about the ayah that you read about make dhikr in abundance. And one of the forms we can make dhikr, if we're remembering Allah in our du'as, we are making dhikr of Allah by making du'a because we have to mention Allah's name. But if we're talking about conceptualizing it, I want us to connect with the dua. Of course, mashallah, Allah mabarak, our shiuch in our masajid, they're reading the, the, the kunut duas, beautiful kunut duas being read with wonderful uh, recitation. And again, they're, they're, they're using this regularly in the, in the kunut duas. Allahumma inna ka afu wa hibbal afu wa afu anni, or in the case afu wa afu afu anna. But are we connecting? Are we understanding it properly? So the, con the, 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 the context is this. The most beloved person to Rasulullah is asking the greatest of creation, what should we do if we find this? And he gives three sentences, essentially seven words. There must be something pretty profound if he gave her three sentences, seven words during this night. Which night? The night of power, the night of Qadr, the night that is worth 1,000 year months. Uh, what does it mean by 1,000 months? Sufyan Athori said that the, uh, a thousand months, the night meaning being worth a thousand months, means that the worship done on this night is worth 1,000 months worth of reward. So this worth 1,000 nights of reward, a lifetime of word, reward, 83 years and four months, 1,000 uh, months, a lifetime of reward. And he gives one sentence, if you find it, you should say this. Now, of course, we said there were many things we should do. We should pray Qiyam, we should read, uh, we should read uh, Quran, we should make dua, we should engage in dhikr, we should do all of these things. But why this particular sentence? Why is this so powerful? That's what I wanted to explain for those of us, a few of us on this call don't speak Arabic. I want us to understand. Our Arabic brothers and sisters may say, no, you've got it wrong, but maybe, maybe we'll see afterwards if, if, if this is perhaps a correct understanding or not. Allahumma innaka afu wa tuhibbul afwa fa'fu anni. 
Oh Allah, you are the Afua and you love Afua, so give me Afua. And I purposely use the word Afua rather than our English translation, which we often use as pardon or forgiveness. Allahumma innaka Afuwan tuhibbal Afu Afu You are the most giving of Afua and you love to give Afua, so give me Afua. What does Afua mean? If we were to just say forgiveness or pardon, like we sometimes translate it, we could equally argue, why would not the dua say, Allahumma innaka ghafooran tahibbul maghfira faghfirli. Allahumma innaka ghafooran tahibbul maghfira faghfirli. Linguistically in English, that's the same thing. Oh Allah, you are the forgiving the ghafooran, and you love uh, uh, forgiveness, tahibbul maghfira faghfirli, so forgive me. Same meaning in English. English is not doing any justice here. Afua and maghfira. So what's the difference between afua and maghfira? Last weekend, there was a, a webinar and, and one of the sessions, we looked very deeply at the names of uh, Al-Ghafur and Al-Ghafar. And we can conclude from that that the name of uh, Al-Ghafur, Al-Ghafar, the concept of Maghfira is to forgive. So if Allah were to give us Maghfira, he would forgive us for the sins that we've done. He would shield us on the day of judgment from even other people necessarily knowing about those sins that we've done. He would ultimately, inshallah, enter, enter us into Jannah by giving us maghfirah for all of these multitude of sins that you and I have committed in our lives. But he himself would remind us of them. That's the difference. He himself would remind us of them. We would stand before Allah and Allah would remind us did you realize you did this? Do you remember did that? And we'll be embarrassed. We're going to be looking down thinking, yeah, I did that. Would any of us want to stand if we'd been, if uh, with, with our uh, uh, internet browsing history as, as kids before our parents? We'd be too embarrassed. Oh my God, bro, look at that, wasting my time. I think she thought I was studying and actually I was reading that. None of us would like that. What about the multitude of sins that we've committed? Would we want to stand before Allah with that multitude of sins? With Afua, however, yes, yes, of course, Allah will forgive us. Even, even he'll remind us and we might be embarrassed and ashamed to stand before Allah with that multitude of sins. But with Afua, Afua will leave no remembrance, no reminder of the fact that we even had committed that sins in the first place. So one of the translations that the, uh, the, the, the linguists use for us English speakers, they say sometimes uh, Afua refers to the wind the wind that removes and blows away the footprints from the sand, for example. So it would be used in Arabic language. And again, Sheikh Mosin can correct me later on if this is not correct, that they would be used in the Arabic language that the footprints that were left in the desert on the sand, the afua means that the wind has blown them away. There's not even a trace remaining of it. There's not even a trace remaining of it. It's been erased. Now, if we use the word forgiveness or pardon, we can't understand erased. Maghfira, there's still a trace. Allah's going to remind us about it. Even in private, he's going to say, do you remember you did this? And we're going to be ashamed. With Afua, there's no trace. It's completely erased. Imagine if you had a pen and you wrote on a, pen, on a page and then you rubbed it out or a pencil and you rubbed it out. The indentation still even leaves a little bit of a mark on the page, right? If that page had Afua from the, from the, from the, uh, uh, from the pencil, there would not even be an indentation. It would be as though it never happened. It would be as though it never happened. So the things that we did, of course, Allah remembers all of them. But you and I won't be reminded of them. You and I will not be reminded of those things that you and I did that we would not want to stand before Allah, embarrassed and ashamed of those things. Even if nobody else knows, would we want to stand before Allah with that embarrassment? No. So the Prophet ﷺ chose the concept of afwa rather than maghfira. Because this means that it will be erased, completely removed, no trace, all these mistakes, all these sins, all these errors, completely removed, all the traces removed. And as a result of it, what happens if you're completely free, devoid, removed of all of that sin? You're now in the best position possible. But subhanAllah, there is a second meaning alongside that of uh, forgiveness, erasing, um, wiping clean. 
The second concept of afur, for us who speak English, is to give without constraint. To give without constraint. It is often translated, there's an ayah so in Surah Baqarah which uses the word afur, and that, that particular translation there is to give in excess and abundance. Excess and abundance. Well, ziyada, even more, increasing. So this concept of giving you in abundance and excess, if we put this together, this is about as holistic a dua as you could probably hope to get. Because you're now saying, Allahumma innaka afoon. Oh Allah, you are the one who forgives, wipes away, erases the traces of all sins. And you give in excess and abundance. Allahumma innaka afoon. Tahib al afwa. And you love to be the one who wipes away, erases, leaves no trace and gives in abundance and excess. So please, Fafu uh, Anni, so please wipe away, leave no trace, take away the memory of all of my sins and give in excess and abundance. SubhanAllah. Suddenly the dua that we hear so frequently recited by the Imams and even by ourselves, Allahumma inna kafu wa tahib al afwa fafwani. Sometimes we're so fast with it. If we conceptualize the importance of these seven sentences, seven words, these, these three sentences, this is now pretty enormous. This is, this is much more than just a simple dua. This is much more than just a, a dua to be just quickly uh, mentioned like that. This is something really significant. All of our sins can be completely wiped away, no trace remaining, not even an indentation. So when we stand there, it's as though we never did them at all. And we can be given what? Given in dunya and in akhirah. Why not? We're asking Allah for his afwa, uh, for him to be al afwa for us. Therefore, what does it mean? We can be given in excess and abundance in dunya and in akhirah, inshallah. Why not? Now we see how comprehensive this dua really, really is. What an amazing dua we've been taught. So now when we start looking, searching, seeking, pursuing, hoping for the finding of Laylatul Qadr, now with these nights remaining, we know it's on the, on the last 10. Well, we have nine of those remaining. We know it's probably on the odd nights, but you know, as, as Dr. Hisham said yesterday, why would you want to take a chance? Should we not go for all of those, all of those uh, nights as best as we can? And I'm going to say something which, which, again, forgive me if you're all very, very, very familiar with this story, because those of you who know me for a while know that I've mentioned this story many, many years before. Uh, so I, I, I apologize if, if you've heard it too many times, but I use this as an incentive for myself. When we think about that reward of a thousand months, a lifetime worth of worship, when we think about the enormity of this night and how much we can possibly get from it, we have to ask ourselves, have we estimated Allah's deal properly? Yesterday, Dr. Sham used the word a trade-off. He's giving you a trade-off, you know, one night of worship or 10 nights of worship, and in return, a lifetime's worth of reward. So we ask myself, I ask myself the question, have I properly estimated what this means? Have I understood the deal that is on offer, the trade that is, is being offered here, that I need to give up worldly pleasures? sleep uh whatever else it may be phone or whatever whatever consumes our time and instead replace that with the worship of allah with the qiyam with the tilawat with the dua with the dhikr of allah with whatever worship worship we can make have i properly estimated that deal is it worth making that effort for to remind myself what is worth making an effort for I'm going to bring the same story that I said I've mentioned so many times before, but uh, I feel it's appropriate for this occasion, so I'll mention it again. And it concerns a couple of Sahaba at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu There was a young orphan boy at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu and he was trying to build a wall around the edge of his property, and it was between his property, his his land, and his neighbor's land. On the edge of that land, there was a palm tree that was on the boundary between his land and, and his neighbor's land. And that was obstructing the wall. So either he needed to cut down the tree or incorporate that tree 
into the boundary wall so that he could continue the wall along his along his boundary. That tree, however, belonged to the neighbor's farm, not his, not his land. And the neighbor was a companion by the name of Abu Lababa, radiallahu uh, anhu. So the young boy, the orphan boy, came to Abu Lababa and he said, oh, Abu Lababa, could you give me that tree so I can construct my wall along this uh, boundary? Abu Lababa said, no, the, the tree is mine. He said, then how about you sell me the tree so I can build my wall? Again, Abu Lababa said, no, the, the, the tree is mine. The boy said, by Allah, I'm going to complain to the Prophet. The child got upset. And he said, I'm going to complain because he really wanted to build that, that wall and he really needed the tree to do so. So he went and he told Rasulullah exactly what happened with the uh, discussion with Abu Lababa. Rasulullah softly said, where is Abu Lababa? Call Abu Lababa. So Abu Lababa was brought to the Prophet. He said, oh, Abu Lababa. Give him the tree. Abu Lubaba is now annoyed. The Prophet is being complained to by this boy about him, who, 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 who wouldn't be a bit ashamed and a bit embarrassed. So he's about annoyed with this boy. So when he says, oh, give him the tree, Abu Lubaba. Abu Lubaba said, no. Oh, Messenger of Allah, the tree is my haq. He's annoyed. The Prophet salam, said to him, oh, Abu Lubaba, why didn't you sell him the tree? He said, no, O oh, Messenger of Allah, the tree is mine. Hearing this, the little boy, the orphan boy, he started to cry because he really wanted to try to complete his, his construction. His tears started to flow and he began to cry. We all know that the, the mercy, the rahmah that Rasulullah had for young children, especially for orphans, he saw this and he said, oh, Abu Lubaba, give him a branch, give him the tree. For a branch of this tree, you will have a tree in Jannah. For a branch of this tree, you will have a tree in Jannah. Look at the deal, the trade that's being offered. For a branch of this tree, there is a tree in Jannah. How many branches does a, does a tree have? Hundreds and hundreds of branches on one tree. He's saying for one branch of this tree, there's a tree in Jannah. Still Abu Lubaba is annoyed. He said, I don't want it. And then he went to leave. The boy is crying. Rasulullah is with the boy. Abu Lubaba is leaving, annoyed with what's taken place. But nearby, there was another companion, Abu Dahla, radiallahu anhu. He saw the boy crying and he saw all of that scene that took place. So he went close to Rasulullah and he said, if I were to purchase the same tree, will I get the same deal? Will I get the same offer? Is that just for Abu Lababa? Rasulullah said, no, the deal is for anyone. If you purchase the tree, the same deal applies for you. Abu Dahda ran after Abu Lababa radiallahu anhu. And he said, oh, Abu Lubaba, do you know my orchard? Oh, Abu Lubaba, do you know my orchard? One narration says 400 trees were in the orchard of Abu Dahda. Another narration said 600 trees in the orchard of Abu uh, Dahda. He said, oh, Abu Lubaba, do you know my orchard? It's yours for that tree. My whole orchard for that one tree. Abu Lubaba in this narration turned around and he said, are you out of your mind? Abu Dahda said, no. It is yours. And oh, people watching, bear witness. Abu Lubaba saying, yeah, I mind. You're going you're gonna to sell me your whole orchard for one tree. Are you crazy? Abu Dhaka was very serious. He said, no, it's yours. Oh, people bear witness to the people bear witness. And he made the exchange, his whole entire orchard for this one tree of Abu Lubaba. He then went to Rasulullah Wasallam, and the boy was sitting there and said, oh boy, the tree is yours. The boy was so happy, he was smiling, and of course this made Rasulullah وسلم, very, very happy. Abu Dahda went back to his orchard, and he called from the outside of the orchard. He didn't even go in. He called from the outside of the orchard. He said, oh, Um Dahda. She replied, yes, Abu Dahda. He said, come out of the orchard. Bring the children, come out of the orchard. She said, why? He said, we have sold it. He didn't say we've sold it to Abu Lubaba. We have sold it to Allah and his messenger. What did she say in return? She didn't turn around and say, what have you done selling our trees? What have you done selling our garden? How are we going to live? The maqam of the Sahaba and Sahabi, may Allah be pleased with them all, was this. She said, what a successful deal. Umdahada started to leave the garden. 
And as the children were leaving with her, they had some of the dates from the palm trees in the hand. She opened the uh, hand, put the palm, the, the dates on the floor, and she said, they belong to Allah, my child. They belong to Allah, my child. Now, Abu Dahda was offered a deal. Let's see the conclusion of the deal that he was offered. Just as you and I are being offered a deal on Layl al-Qadr. Let's see the, 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 the conclusion of the deal that Abu, uh, Abu Dahda was being offered. At the Battle of Uhud, when the Rasul was being surrounded and attacked after being injured on the battlefield, and Sahaba were, were putting their lives on the line, literally putting their bodies in front of the arrows, in front of the blades, in front of the spears to defend the noble body of Rasulullah sallallahu Abu Dahda was one of those that put his body on the line. Abu Dahda was one of those that took the, 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 the blows, that took the arrows, that took the, the, the brutality that was aiming at Rasulullah sallallahu He was ready to put his life in, in front of those, those blows in order to protect the Prophet At the end of the Battle of Uhud, Rasulullah was looking at all of the bodies of the shuhada. One of them was Abu Dahda. And he came up to the body of Abu Dahda. And he knelt beside the body of Abu Dahda. And tears in his eyes, but a smile on his face, he said, how many trees for you in Jannah, O Abu Dahda? How many trees for you in Jannah, O Abu Dahda? Who's saying this? Rasulullah how many trees he estimated a deal my brothers and sisters he estimated that for giving up his garden of 400 to 600 trees he's getting what in return how many trees for you in jannah oh abu Dahda? he was a shaheed just before he protected the prophet's body Rasulullah said uh, my my companion in jannah for whoever can protect me my companion in Jannah for whoever so he's got that as well and now he's kneeling before his body saying how many trees for you in Jannah oh Abu Dhab he was offered a deal and he took it he ran towards it the trade was worth it you and I my brothers and sisters are being offered a deal a lifetime 83 years and four months worth of reward for what for our worship in these last nine days, nine nights of Ramadan. I didn't want to overlap anything that our Dr. Hisham had said yesterday. I just wanted to try maybe to inshallah focus, focus our attention, focus our abilities, focus our minds, look at the deal, look at the trade <clears throat> and ask the question of myself, is it worth it? Alhamdulillah, it's worth it. A lifetime of worship for the effort for 10 nights to give up what? Bit of sleep, other things, were whatever capacity we can. Maybe, maybe whatever capacity we can. Allah give us tawfiq that we can do the whole night to our best of ability. If we can't half, if we can't a third, whatever tawfiq we can to make the maximum effort to engage in the dhikr of Allah through the qiyam, through the tilawat, through the dua, and through the dhikr of Allah. I hope, inshallah, that Allah give every one of us the ability and that we truly benefit from these nights, and inshallah, that we are able to seek, pursue, find Layl al-Qadr in this blessed month of Ramadan. Our time has come to an end, so I'll hand you back, inshallah, to Dr. Saad. Jazakallah, khaira jazah, and you know, I, I honestly could be listening to you for hours on end, because the way you portray it, as you said, it's really just cemented what Dr. Hisham has said yesterday, but more, much, much more important, gave it a super flavor to me, really. I really enjoyed every bit of it. Sheikh Mahsin. Uh, same, same here, Allah. Barakallah, Brother Asim. And two, two things really, uh, you know, draw my, my attention, you know, uh, when you compare between Allahumma uh, Naka'afu and Kareem to Habbul Af and Maghfira. So it's, uh, SubhanAllah is completely uh, different. And, uh, and uh, SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this beautiful dua and beautiful day, 
is is amazing is completely different from maghfira subhanallah uh, may allah azza wa jalla inshallah grant us uh, afwa and maghfira allahu mm-hmm. amin the other thing is uh, w- yeah whenever i hear uh, the story of uh, sayyidna abu lubaba uh, subhanallah is different <laughs> different life i feel i'm in a different life jazakallah khair barakallahu fik jazakallah khair jazakallah khair any any questions any comment to sheikh asim please now this is your opportunity and uh, we've only got one more dose from him next Monday, insha'Allah. Uh, but uh, this is your opportunity to ask any questions or make any comments. Uh, it's free for all. And there are comments saying uh, such beautifully illustrated. <laughs> May we all reach Laylatul Qadr, insha'Allah, Ya Rabbi, Ya Kareem. Amen. If not, once again, I thank uh, Brother Asim so much for a beautiful uh, half an hour of really very illustrative uh, talk. And inshallah will be uh, helping each one of us to strengthen our belief and to spend more effort, as he said, in the last uh, straight home st- uh, home straight of the Ramadan, inshallah. Uh, I'll ask Sheikh Mahsin to conclude, please. Jazakallah uh, khairan, barakallahu feekum. Maybe if Dr. Yanu Saad allow me, I just would like to um, tell the brothers and sisters, inshallah, we are happy to collect the uh, zakah as well in the university mosque if you want zakat al-fitr uh, to help you to distribute it, inshallah, or zakat al-mal. Maybe hopefully me or Dr. Saad will uh, post something on Unimask as well to remind people about this. Or uh, Samira Foundation, whatever you like. But we are, inshallah, opening the door for uh, brothers and sisters to transfer the zakah to us. And then, inshallah, we'll distribute it. Barakallahu fikum. Just just to remind myself and the others, is preferably is given to people in... Uh, around us in this country, isn't that right? And not yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Inshallah, and we have a couple of uh, you know people we know uh, they need some support. Inshallah, Jazakumullah uh, khairan. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashadu alla ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruk wa natub ilayk. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wal asr. Inna al insan la fi khusr. Illa aladina aman wa amal salihat wa tawasub bil haq wa tawasub bil sabr. Subhan rabbika rabbil azza wa amma yasifun. وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم جزاكم الله خير الجزاء and thank you again for the awesome السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته